Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar today. I'm Francis Seeley from Globalnet 21, and uh, we've got a very special webinar today. We're going to look at a particular problem, and the problem is one that has been around for decades, and it's AIDS and HIV. And we're going to look at what one person who, who lives very close to me has done herself to try and address this problem. She became very involved in it. She got passionate about it, and she felt she had to do something, and it's Margaret Turnbull. Now, she'll tell us about herself, but she's a very active person, and she's involved in all sorts of things. She's been a teacher. She's been a principal. She's got an academic background and she's involved in lots of voluntary things but we'll hear from her because she'll tell you a lot better than me anyhow margaret thank you for joining us today and um, maybe we could start if you could just tell us very briefly just a little bit about your background um yes well i i i did i i went to college i started in teaching and uh what my way through teaching, ending up as a head teacher, a principal in a secondary school. And I worked there for eight or so years, um, kind of achieving mostly what I wanted. Um, it was a poor school uh, and we were pushing the boundaries of uh, getting the students to achieve high levels. Um, and, and ultimately for the type of child we got, we made best progress or very high progress uh, for them. Um, then um, uh, circumstances met, actually. I, I ended up with a fractured spine and a few other bits and pieces and thought, maybe it's time for me to do something else. <laughs> um, and I became a consultant. I, I worked for local authorities, I worked for government, uh, traveling around the country, uh, focusing on working with schools that were struggling to help them restructure and become effective. Um, ultimately, my target was to make myself redundant. Okay, but you didn't make yourself redundant. That's the very last thing you did. You said, yeah, but you, redundant. You said you suddenly got an interest in South Africa, didn't you? How did that come about? That's it. So while I was doing that, I had time. I, in fact, at the beginning, 22 years ago, I went to a conference in South Africa and discovered that uh, I had relatives over there, relatives of my brother's wife, um, and they introduced me to an AIDS center there uh, in a place called Hillcrest. Part of the conference was about AIDS. It was a seroptimist conference and it all started there. So the seroptimists are to blame um, and the AIDS centre I visited and then form a, formed a relationship with. They were, they were just superb. They, they, I, they even let me go through their finances to check that they were totally okay. Okay, so blame the Thropter, if it's Thropter, yeah, blame. and you can tell us about them in a minute, but obviously you focused on AIDS, and AIDS is a really big issue, isn't it, in education, because so many children are affected. Yeah, I mean, uh, South Africa has got one of the highest proportion of AIDS in the world, um, and it, I think it still has, it's huge. Um, basically several generations have been lost so you end up with the what's known as the goggles the grandparents with maybe seven or eight children because their sons and daughters are dead um education when i started in the rural township um, i work in a rural it's not like soweto it's spread it's it's known as the valley of a thousand hills and that describes it so it's totally spread. Um, they had to pay for education. They didn't have the money for it. They had to pay for school uniform if the schools let them in. Um, and they couldn't do that. So that's where I started, basically. And, uh, and when you started, your aim was to help the children of parents in deprived areas. Now, that's a pretty daunting task. How did you go about that? Can you give us some examples? Well, as I say, I, link, I, I first was introduced to the Hillcrest AIDS 
centre. And of course, you can't go to a foreign country and suddenly, you know, decide you're going to do this, that or the other. You have to work through an organisation or an agency you trust. And having really researched the charity, I went to their then CEO to tell them my first thought was to raise money in England as I was in and out of schools to pay for the AIDS orphans education. And as I was saying that to her, she was almost simultaneously saying, could you raise money for the AIDS orphans? Because our focus is on the people with AIDS and we know there are hundreds of children left in our area without any help. But you didn't just raise money, and we'll come to the money uh, question in a step, minute. Yeah, but you, step one. Yeah, that was step one. Okay. Well, now tell us about how you raised money because you did do a lot of work, didn't you? And in the in Changa Technical School, for example, you raised money. How do you actually raise funds? What did you do to go about getting the money you needed? Um, well, for, for the AIDS orphans, I really went out to schools, schools and churches. Um, uh, and it was the early days. I didn't have a web page. I didn't have a Facebook page. I didn't even have an official charity then. It was only a few years in, uh, three or four, that I thought I really must register and become official. Um, so we went to them. I was able to show them pictures, talk about it, and the schools raised money. They They had their... English schools are brilliant at raising money for good causes. And especially the children could see they were buying children the right to be educated. And they did, gleefully. So stage one, you started raising money and you did that really successfully. And it's great how schools responded. But what you wanted to do was to get the children in South Africa, the, the children who have parents who probably died from AIDS, you wanted to get them to have a secure future and a job. Now, you, you started the Hillcrest Trust. Can you tell us about how you went about doing all of that? Um, well, um... Yes, uh, things grow a bit like Topsy when I'm around. So following on from uh, raising funds, um, I started thinking I really would like English children in poorer schools, ordinary schools, to be able to have the opportunity to do community service abroad. I mean, if you were well off and had £3,000, you could be flown anywhere in the world and people would have you in schools or building bridges or farming and I thought why shouldn't the other children have that opportunity so I talked to four of the ex-white secondary schools well two were private schools two were state schools to say I'd like to bring children over uh, they're not wealthy would you consider hosting them on alternate years? And all four schools say, yes, we would. That would be great. Um, and the idea was uh, I'd have two schools hosting one year, two schools hosting the next year, and they'd host between them about 20 children. So um, that began in about 2008 and went on, oh, up to two, three years before the pandemic struck. So it's quite a long time, about 14 years. Um, and did that mean that you um, had to form a trust, a charity in order to do that? Yeah, before that, I actually did. I, I actually uh, made it a, a, an official uh, English charity. So we're on the charity commission list because people said to me, while well, you're raising money for AIDS orphans, if you're official, you'd be able to go to companies as well and they're able to discount money they might give you. So I thought, well, sounds worth it and I'm not going away. So I, I, I actually went to a lawyer who dealt with those kind of things who um, helped me process and get uh, acceptance. So you got acceptance and you, you began to do 
uh, this this really amazing job of bringing children from South Africa to the UK. And no, vice to, versa. Oh, was it vice versa? You didn't do it's, it both ways. I had I was under no, the understanding. No, it's just we couldn't afford to pay for children to come from South Africa to England as much as I'd love to. Uh, it really was about getting the children in England to go over for three weeks and, and work. And the idea was they would actually help paint and decorate these schools, which were really neglected. I mean, the government doesn't put any money in for painting, decorating or anything. So they just get older and dirtier. Well, they they must have loved that the kids who went over from 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 the UK. But I mean, you also wanted to educate, not just to decorate, didn't you? And I mean, how did you then establish some sort of education program that got kids into secure jobs? Um, yes. Well, first of all, the once we got uh, children into schools, and I was working in schools with closer contact. I was able to kind of select schools that I could see would be were eager to work on learning. Um, it's not the same as in England. <laughs> you have people in the jobs. Remember, in those days, most of them were trained during apartheid. So their education as teachers was extremely basic and they've had very little help since. So when I selected the schools and I would, you know, hopefully each year, I, most of them I did, then I started working with the school. So I began with mentoring the principal, um, building a relationship that they could ask me when they had issues and we could look at how that could change. And then I could introduce the opportunity of training um, and work with the school's training staff in things like behaviour management and uh, how to teach using differentiation, things that would actually help them, enable them to be able to teach more effectively so the children could be more successful. Did you do this all on your own or did you have support in helping with the training and the mentoring? No, I'm the one man trainer. <laughs> um, so it has to be limited. Still working the aid centre and they have a, a, a young people's group now there. They're going into schools and helping educate children about AIDS, HIV and how to um, how to say no and not get themselves affected. Um, they would also know schools and say, look, these are proactive schools, they're very positive, and you'd be able to work with them and, and do developmental work. Um, and then later on, I actually linked with another South African charity known Partners for Possibility, which links business people with principals in the rural areas to help um, the principals learn how to manage, how to run schools, because they've got no training, they've got no skills. And that's what I was doing when I was mentoring. But it meant, uh, I, it was logical, we linked together. So I did a couple of sessions where I was training. Uh, they brought together the head teachers or the principals of all the schools in the Durban area. And I did training sessions with them. So you, you had a system where you brought children from the UK to South Africa, you did training and you did mentoring, but you also established, didn't you, this sort of network that linked disadvantage with, advantage, with schools that had advantages. Um, I mean, how did you do that? That was probably quite a difficult thing to do, wasn't it? Um, well, it's, it, it's limited. I mean, the, the, the two... The four schools who uh, originally uh, were working with hosting, they did get involved and provide some support. Um, the, just before COVID, it was practically I was getting too old to be hosting and dealing with uh, 24 children coming over, even with two teachers. So I said, we, I couldn't bring English children over. And the South African sort of schools, jumped and said, well, why can't you take our children in? Our children have not been in township. Our children want to do community service. We know what you do works. And for 
for three, four years before the pandemic, um, I was taking groups of 24 children with their teachers and we were doing the same job. And by then it wasn't just painting and decorating, they did a week's teaching as well. So I taught the children to teach and <laughs> <laughs> I was a very strict head teacher, um, but it was wonderful. And, and several children over the years, English and um, South African have actually gone into teaching because they said, we actually loved it. <laughs> So, I mean, you, you encouraged them to talk about what they did as well, didn't you, to tell their stories. How important is that? Because you can tell people like you're telling and we're telling. But when people tell their own stories, it's more emotive, isn't it? Yeah, it's... I approach people that I, I think will we'll be able to do that and will do that. One young man um fell in love with the South Africa just the same way as I did he came out on I think the second trip in 2009 um he's music orientated and if people go on the website they can read his story but basically he now runs a charity and goes into that area but he's developing music and choirs in the rural areas so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so the whole thing sort of snowballs, which is really interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, you say you fell in love with Africa. I've met many people who fall in love with Africa and wanted to do things, not because of any sort of middle class sort of view that we should do it, because they fell in love with it. And in the snowballing that, that happened that we're talking about, you did other things, didn't you? I mean, for example, you did a horticulture so that people could find a way to be to, to get food and be sustainable. How did that develop? Um, yeah, it, it, it literally was one of the principles in particular I, I worked with regularly. Uh, and, and would keep going back and working with his school because it, it and it was starting to achieve really good results, which is my key thing. Um, but a lot of the families, if they could learn how to produce food themselves, then obviously their lives would be a lot easier. Um, the aid centre did some work. They had a horticulturalist that went, went out. Uh, initially, it was breaking down the barrier of, oh, you want us to be the kitchen boy, the, you know, under apartheid, the men would be the gardeners for the memsal. Um, so it, it, once you broke down that barrier, teaching them to be able to grow their own crops, their own vegetables was a huge help. So the school set aside land, we raised money here. I linked with someone in a church, they raised money as well, and we were able to fence off and prepare two large gardens where they could grow crops. And we got someone in to help with the students, the young people, they were primary, but they were learning how to grow. And we heard quite a few of them started it outside their own homes, growing some things themselves. So it's small time, but in fact, those small things can make quite a difference. Yeah, I mean, they, they do. But you also did other things as well, didn't you? You ran leadership camps outside of Durban. I mean, how did you find time to do that? Well, no, the leadership, well, I, I did take, in the early days, we took them away. We took a, a small group away. It was primary schools. They finished primary at the end of grade seven in South Africa. So in their last year, four or five of the schools we work with regularly would identify two, three, four students who had really worked hard academically, despite possibly caring for mother and father who were dying or being AIDS orphans and looking after younger siblings. And this was their treat but it was leadership and, and a couple of times we took them to a game reserve, a uh, couple of times we took them elsewhere, but then I found, and it, it was challenging, then I found an organisation that works close to Hillcrest, um, which is about putting on leadership camps and we kind of gently persuaded them to help us financially as well. And we now do take, well, it started again this year after the pandemic, 
Um, we take about 12 or 14 children and they spend two nights, so they get three days. And they're doing kayaking, they're doing abseiling. But the whole focus is about building teamwork, developing team skills, developing leadership. So I can step back now and just see the lovely pictures and the successes they achieve. I don't think you'll step back at all. Tell, tell us about some of the successes you've had. I mean, if you gave us one or two examples that you're really pleased about. Oh, I, well, um, oh, gosh, it must be so great. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So six years ago, one of the principals came to me begging uh, that they had two children. It was two uh, adjacent primaries. And they said, these two children, it was two girls, are just, in our terms, exceptional. Their ability is superb. And if they go to an ordinary township school, this is going to be lost. They, they'll do okay, but they'll never reach their potential. So I went to uh, one of the schools we worked with regularly in Hillcrest, told the story and said, could you help us with the school fees? Because in South Africa, even if you go to a state school, there are school fees. You can get reductions if you live in the area, but have little money. But school fees are like 30,000 rand, so, so kind of £1,500 a year, uh, which for those people is a lot. And anyway, the, the principal very generously said, yes, we want to support the community and that those communities will halve our, well, more than half our school fees. They, they took it down to virtually nothing. Uh, but you'll have to find the transport costs and the uniforms and the books. They, they don't get free books in South Africa. They have to buy all their exercise books and some of their textbooks. Um, and that's what we did. So I went out as well as saying I need money for school, school uniforms is I now need money to pay for these children's education. They have just completed their first year at university. They're now in their second year, uh, term start in January uh, in South Africa, uh, the year starts then. Our one is studying accountancy and contacted me to say, show me her results, but say, I only got five distinctions on papers <laughs> out of eight. So I've got to work harder on the other three. And the other one who is studying law six years, uh, got the Dean's Award, which is for academic success and progress. Well, that's pretty amazing. And, and I'm sure you have other stories as well. Uh, well, these but... two, they have earned, and we've got another three. We've got two going into grade 11 this year, and we've got one who's in grade 10. Poor child, and she is again doing so well. She started school in January, and everything was closed by the end of February, early March. So we had to get computers for them, uh, laptops. They had to be taught how to use them so they could learn online for a year and a half. So, so you're doing all this, and that's amazing. And you also belong to the Sferoptimists, don't you, yeah. as well? I mean, how do you find time to do that on top of everything else that you're doing? Um, well, I squeeze it. It was easier once I retired. <laughs> <laughs> and I did always say that South Africa was my retirement plan, so it keeps the grey cells going. Um, I work in South Africa physically about four months a year. I do three trips of just over six weeks when I can work with principals, leave them with tasks. When I go back, I check how they're getting on. Um, and then I do some work obviously online uh, with them that I can make sure things are happening. Like, as you said, we've been raising money to build two classrooms that should have been built in 2000 um because the school just can't fit the children in anymore um so i you know i kind of work around it there are so many months that i'm focusing on south africa and then other times i'm focusing on 
uh, things to do with the Sir Optimist and I just have to compartmentalise and try and say no sometimes, but it's difficult. Saying no is always difficult. You, but, but you're about to go to South Africa in a few days' time, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, what do you plan to do when you go there this time? Um, well, I'm already lining up training. So I've got two scores, new scores that I'm going into. And I'll, I met them last time I was over uh, in uh, um, October, November. So they're starting behaviour management training. Two of my principals that I've worked with for about seven or eight years uh, in primary have just got secondary posts so as head teachers, principals. So I did some work with them online to help prepare them as they were going in. And I'm going into both of those. They want me to go in uh, to carry on mentoring with them, but possibly, probably begin training. Uh, the principles. I, I'm going to be sorting out what's happening with the school. Uh, um, I have the two classrooms are, are they're getting the roofs, uh, hopefully Friday and today. Uh, the, uh, a, a, another organisation provided the um, corrugated iron, so that should be going on. So there's kind of enough to keep me busy and a few more <laughs> little bits and pieces besides. And once I'm over there, I'll be um, contacting other schools and seeing how they are. And I'm, we are starting the project again this year, um, just painting and decorating, not teaching. So the parents feel more confident about their children going into township and working. So I've got to go and visit that school sort out what we need, paint, and then go to the paint companies and see what I can get. <laughs> and so it rolls. I'll, I'll have enough to keep me busy, let's put it that way. Well, you're actually a very good role model for retirement. If you want to retire, keep active. That's the message. That's the way to keep, you know, the yeah. uh, hate of grey cells going and to keep alive. And that, that's, that's what you're doing. So listen, it, you know, we come to the end of this now, but if you... You know, if anyone wanted to find out more about what you're doing, if they wanted to offer help in any way, I mean, how would they go about doing that? Uh, right. Well, if they go into Facebook and they put in Hillcrest AIDS, that's all one word, Hillcrest and AIDS dot UK, that will bring up our Facebook page. And the same applies to our website, which is hillcrestaids.org.uk. Uh, and we, we try to keep that as up to date as we can, um, often pleading for money, <laughs> obviously. I wasn't able to get to schools for two years, so <laughs> but a company uh, and their ex-South Africans read about us and they have been putting money in fantastically. I mean, I, I can't express my thanks to them. They know I try. Um, but uh, so those two, we keep you up to date. There is therefore opportunities to donate via the website. Uh, and I'm notified of that. Um, and also when we put out an appeal, um, you can donate via Facebook. Okay, well, um, I mean, that, that's quite amazing. I mean, when I met you first, I just thought you were involved in the Optimus, and then I found you have this amazing story. Uh, it's always interesting about people, what you find out first. You don't know what lies behind it, and you're doing a huge amount of work, and I think it's really a good story of, of what you're doing, and it has obviously a very important positive effect for children who clearly have been through really tragic times. So, Margaret, I mean, thanks for telling us about it thanks for telling us about what you do and the work that you do and i hope people will watch this i hope people you know can uh, sort of engage with it and also help in some way or the other so it's been a really pleasure great pleasure interviewing you and it's uh, been really interesting to hear about your story so thanks for joining us margaret and we'll uh, end this interview now okay thank you very much <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.